in the assessment aspect. Um, a healthcare professional or a dietitian would look at a patient's diet history and then go into their family history with GI disorders. Next, they would go into kind of identifying what reoccurring abdominal pain that person's experiencing and the change in frequency or, or stool that they're having, and then just identify other symptomatic things that they have going on. And then on procedures, you can see those are some procedures that are actually used for IBS. And then there's also tests done to rule out both celiac disease and um, lactose intolerance. And then below are just lab markers that are also used. So an intervention, usually a, this would be a dietitian, and they would individualize a diet based on that patient's symptoms. They would encourage regular eating patterns, good sleep, and good bowel hygiene. They'd also talk about implementing physical activity and consuming adequate fluids to avoid constipation. They also might talk to you about monitoring possible intolerances to gluten, and then limiting foods in FODMAPs, and identifying um, added food chemicals that may be possible offending agents. So a little bit about the food and nutrition. A dietitian would tell you to avoid high sugar and fat intake and then increase that soluble fiber. It, they also might talk to you about an exclusion diet and how these three usually are the ones that are talked about because they do affect the gut. And then in nutrition and education and counseling, um, it would be really important for a dietitian to explain to a patient that IBS is not harming their intestines, nor does it lead to cancer. Um, also, the importance of hydration. Hydration is important in everything, but especially in your GI health and keeping you regular. And then, again, those bowel movements, planning them out. Um, they would also talk to you about implementing smaller, more frequent meals for toleration of symptoms. And then different steps in stress management and regular exercise. So here I have the in, um, my intervention with the low FODMAP diet, and FODMAP is actually an acronym that stands for fermentable oleosaccharides, monosaccharides, oh, fermentable oleosaccharides, disaccharides, um, monosaccharides, and polyols. And a FODMAP are, are poor, poorly absorbed short chain carbohydrates. They influence the amount of gas produced in the intestinal tract. And as you see on this nice list over here, um, these food components are restricted in the low FODMAP diet. So, why is this diet used? Well, this diet isn't meant to treat IBS, but rather to alleviate the symptoms an individual may experience. The low FODMAP diet is mainly used to help with abdominal pain, gas, and bloating. So then a little bit about how to do the low FODMAP diet. It's done in three phases. Phase one, elimination. Phase two, that reintroduction slash determining your sensitivities. And phase three, where you would personalize your diet based on what you have um, discovered. So elimination phase is two to six weeks. And what you want to do in this phase is really eliminate high FODMAP foods from your diet to really lower as many symptom um, as, as you experience. And then you would go into um, the second phase, which is determining those sensitivities. And here is where it's kind of a longer phase, it's six to eight weeks. And here you would want to reintroduce foods, maybe one or two at a time that are on that high FODMAP list to kind of identify what triggers you and what, what things you can um, have into your diet. And then three, again, once you've identified different triggers, you can start um, personalizing something that helps for your alleviation of symptoms. So during that first elimination phase, you would want to start a food log and track your intake and your symptoms. Uh, this is imp it's important to review this with an RD because an RD is a great resource and they help you understand what foods to avoid and what foods are safe to have in this diet. And then again, you want to follow it for those two to six weeks. And during these two to six weeks, um, 
it really just reduces Down symptoms as low as they possi can, possibly can be for the next phase. And you'd want to avoid foods with high amounts of dairy, high FODMAP fruits and vegetables, fermentable foods, regular breads and pastas, and sweeteners with high fructose corn syrup. One can always reference a high, a high FODMAP or FODMAP food list if unsure. And then you'd want to limit your portion size at each meal to keep the FODMAP level low enough to avoid symptoms. So a little bit about what that elimination phase with an RD would look like. Um, they would instruct on the low FODMAP foods and provide resources. And these resources could look like meal planning, they could be label reading, they could be low FODMAP products and brand names. And a dietitian would also stress on the importance of a balanced, nutrient-rich diet. Then they would also help identify favorite foods and provide substitutes so that the person doesn't feel like they're totally restricted while doing this um, implementation. A dietitian will also encourage their, their clients or patients to follow this diet as closely as they can because we do not want to also add added stress into this because as research has shown, stress also makes GI symptoms worse. And then they would give details and instruction on how to follow that low FODMAP diet and provide tools to manage this in everyday life. So moving into that second phase, um, phase two is where they're gonna start reintroducing those foods. So they'll, they'll look at their FODMAP list and they'll maybe one or two during this longer period um, um, track different foods that they're taking. So when they're doing this, they want to track symptoms and the food intake, where um, each day they re would record their food and beverage intake, how much they're consuming, and then the symptom type, severity, and onset of that symptom. After that longer phase, they would move into phase three, which is where they start to personalize their diet. And here they should have identified those trigger foods in the last phase. So what that looks like now is eliminating the foods that cause symptoms and then finding those FODMAPs that maybe um, aren't as bad or maybe you individually don't experience. Okay, and then diving into some research. So this is my first research study. The purpose of this study was to compare a diet low in FODMAPs with traditional dietary advice. It was a randomized control trial done in multiple gastroenterology outpatient clinics in Sweden, and it comprised of 67 participants. So inclusion was all patients who met Rome criteria for IBS, and then exclusion were the presence of severe cardiac, liver, neurological, or psychiatric disease or a GI disorder other than IBS. Um, they also were excluded if the um, patients followed an exclusion diet prior to the study. Okay, so in the methods, they did multiple visits. They did three. So in their first visit, there was a screening and this was where they were given info about di the diet and the study. And then the screening period lasted about 10 days where they completed a stool diary for bowel habits, a four-day food diary to compare habitual diets, and then they would go in for their second visit, which was visit two, um, the day zero. So when they were here, it was, they returned to the unit, the research unit, to take a symptom severity questionnaire, and then after they take, took that, they were um, put into a randomized computer program and that program put them on one of the two diets and then based on the diet they got they received dietary advice. So these diets were followed for four consecutive weeks and each patient received four booklets, one for each week that comprised of questionnaires and diaries to be completed during each week. After that intervention period they came back for visit three which was the end of the treatment period and um, the booklets were collected with all of the data, and then they took their final symptom severity questionnaire. So a little bit about the diets that were used in this intervention period. 
So diet A was low FODMAP. When the patients were instructed um, on the diets, the term low FODMAP was not used. Instead, RDs used the terms diet A and diet B. And th this was used to eliminate the bias. And then, so diet A is where participants were restricted intake of foods containing any FODMAPs, and then provided they were provided pamphlets on foods to avoid, alternate food products, and things that they could be looking at and different handouts for this diet. And then patients were instructed to avoid foods, sources rich in fructans, lactose containing foods, rich with sugar, um, alcohols, and artificially sweetened products. And then for that um, diet B, the traditional IBS diet, they had a greater focus on how and when to eat rather than what the foods they were ingesting were. And this diet is actually based on the dietary recommendations from the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence and the British Dietetic Association. During for a diet B, patients were instructed to eat three meals and three snacks every day, never to eat too little or too much, and then never to be too hungry or too full. Here they were also told to reduce fatty foods, coffee, alcohol, fermentable foods, carbonated beverages, and sweeteners. And then a little bit about how they were assessed. They conducted three separate um, symptom severity questionnaires on day zero baseline, middle of the study on 14, and day 29 at the end of the intervention period. They also used stool diaries um, every day throughout the, the screening and intervention. And then they did a four day food diary, both during the screening period and the last week of intervention. Okay, <clears throat> so here, um, this, this figure right here shows the symptom severity was reduced in both groups at the end of the intervention phase compared to baseline. Whereas at day 14, the reintroduction in symptoms reached statistical significance in the low FEDMAP diet. Here I have a table and it shows the total IBS <coughs> scores that I have um, circled and how that showed symptom improvement from baseline to the end of the intervention phase. My next table shows the dietary intake from baseline to um, the end of the intervention phase and noting that the FODMAP consumption decreased for both diets. I also noticed that in this table, they also had an unwanted result in the study where the participants in both diets actually had a lower calorie intake after receiving dietary advice. And this was even though the patients were not advised to reduce intake, receiving that, that um, diet, detailed dietary advice on food limitation led to a decrease in energy. So in conclusion, the low FODMAP diet reduces IBS symptoms as well as the traditional IBS diet advice. And then a lesson I learned from this research was that calorie and nutrient intakes need to be supervised in order to avoid malnutrition if long-term changes are initiated. A strength of the study was that it was single-minded and free from bias. And then a, a limitation was the use of those food diaries only because it risks the underestimation of actual intake by participants. Overall, I gave this research an EAL um, rating of positive. Going into my second study, it's a lot like the first. The purpose of the study was to determine whether the low FODMAP diet improves <coughs> gastrointestinal symptoms in patients with IBS. It was a pr prospective observational study done at the Department of Medicine in New Zealand, and it had 90 participants. Here, all the participants in the study were, had performed breath tests, received dietary intervention, and completed a symptom questionnaire over a three-year time span at these clinics slash hospitals. So the breath testing was a hydrogen methane breath test for SIBO, or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, 
and this was basically used just to kind of see how um, bacteria was actually fermenting and growing in each person's gut to kind of help with diet, um, help with the dietitians to make a personalized diet. And then they also received that dietary advice where they got a one hour initial consultation where they went over a food log they had done prior with the dietitian. And then that dietitian also provided education on the diet. Um, they gave them food lists, gave them safe and restricted foods to develop individual diet plans, offered handouts, recipes, shopping guides, etc. And then after the after the um, the implementation of this diet, they came back and did a 30-minute follow-up. And then for the assessment of this, uh, they used questionnaires based off of bowel habits and symptoms. So inclusion were on um, patients who had the, those. Uh, breath testing, and then the fructose mel, those fructose and lactose mel absorption, and then the dietary consult with experienced dietitians at those hospitals. Exclusions were any significant GI comorbidities um, or uh, past history with bowel resection. And then again, with that intervention, the RDs instructed patients on that low FODMAP diet. Those the patients used a food diary or tracker and then they went to their consultation, and then participants answered two questionnaires for both an initial and the follow-up with the same questions with an addition of adherence and opinion about the diet and degree of symptom change for the, the final. So here I have um, my first chart showing you kind of how the, the different um, improvement of the symptoms worked and how it changed in almost all symptoms from the beginning um, to the end. And then since it's kind of hard to see, I kind of highlighted some of the more common symptoms people experience on this and with IBS. And then this figure shows that ma the majority reported improvement on symptoms assessed. And then again, I highlighted those three most commonly reported symptoms. And as you can see in the study, they were also the three most improved. So conclusion of the study was that the low FODMAP diet um, shows efficacy for IBS patients. The, the strategy of using that breath testing and advice proves a good basis for understanding and adhering to this diet. And then this study had a strength that it was the first prospective study to confirm the efficacy of IBS or of the low FODMAP diet with IBS. And then limitations were um, the response rate was lower than they had hoped. Overall, I gave this a positive rating. And then jumping into my third research article. This one is a little different because it looks at the dietary intake and macro and micronutrients while implementing this diet. So the purpose was to determine changes in reported daily nutrient content before and after four weeks on a low FODMAP diet and then versus the modified National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence MNIST diet. It also wanted to identify nutritional inadequacies based on the comparison of dietary reference intakes in patients with IBSD. It was a post-analysis of a randomized controlled trial entailing four weeks. It was done at a gastroenterology and primary care clinics in Michigan Medical Center. And then there were 78 participants. Inclusion was symptoms um, compatible with IBSD by the ROM3 criteria and a willingness to maintain a stable dose of antidepressants during the study. As you can see, there's, there's quite a few exclusions, so you can read through that, but they also excluded pregnant patients and anyone taking probiotics, antibiotics, narcotics. So the methods of this study were that eligible participants were screened at the hospitals and then they were randomized into one of the two diets, either that low FODMAP diet, where participants were instructed to decrease the intake of FODMAPs, and then 
focus. The second diet, the M Nice diet, where participants were instructed to eat small, frequent meals and avoid trigger foods. For the intervention, they did a three day food log before and during the final week of this four week period. And then they did an additional food record at week two. And they met with an RD before the final week to kind of adjust any of those nutrition um, deficiencies. So for my first table of this, it sh for my results, the, the low FODMAP group actually showed a significant reduction in thiamine, riboflavin, calcium, and sodium. <coughs> but there was no micronutrient reduction in the m -nice group. My next table shows the average calorie adjusted daily nutrient intake before and after the four weeks, where um, after the dietary consult with the RD, there was still a decrease in riboflavin in the low FODMAP group, but there was, but there was an increase in niacin and vitamin B6. There was also no decrease in micronutrient intake in the m -nice cohort. So for results, in comparing both groups pre and post intervention, there were a fewer number of low FODMAP food groups that met, um, food members that met the thiamine and iron um, intake, and then fewer number of m -nice group members met DRIs for calcium and copper. An observation of this study that I noticed was that both diets had decreased in calories consumed and the number of daily meals. So in the conclusion, a decrease in mean intake of several micronutrients were observed with the implementation of the low FODMAP diet. Findings suggest that short-term use of elimination diets do not pose significant um, deficiencies and would be safe to use. A strength was that only a few trials have reported the intake of nutrients during the dietary intervention. A couple limitations were that their complete finding was not possible biases may have been injected by the RDs, and then RDs collecting and analyzing food diaries were aware of the signed intervention. And then they also, the assessment of nutritional intake was in the form of those food records again, which leaves room for error. I gave this article a neutral rating. So on my takeaway, I do believe that the low FODMAP diet proves po po positive evidence and that many studies have indicated that following a low FODMAP diet has helped individuals suffering from symptoms that they are looking to treat or relieve. I don't believe it's for everyone though, because the strict adherence to the low FODMAP diet and the necessity of education and counseling on the diet to be successful. And then a long-term use of this diet may also call, cause malnutrition or nutrient de deficiencies but it is safe for short-term use and to identify those symptomatic food items. So overall, I believe that elimination diets such as the low FODMAP diet may provide positive outcomes and symptoms relief for individuals with IBS. So here are my references.